I'd like to welcome you all to our Wednesday night devotional. I'm Sharonda Duncan, and I'm glad that you decided to join us. Um, I'd like to start with a prayer, so please pray with me. Father God, thank you for this day, and it's time to share your words. Please be with us as we study these passages, and help me say what you would have me to say. Give us open ears, minds, and hearts to hear what you would have us to hear. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 30. So if you want to turn to your Bibles and get, find those scriptures, that would be great. Um, this is the verses that happens right after John the Baptist. Jesus is explaining who John the Baptist is. And he's responding to a question that John the Baptist has asked about his identity. John the Baptist asks, are you the one who has come to come or should we wait for another? And this discussion leads to a very important lesson on discipleship. One of the most powerful images that Jesus uses in this lesson is the yoke. Let me read the verses to you. Okay, to what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipes for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say here is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Be wisdom, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. At that, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things that have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am a gentle and humble, I am, I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, now, like I said, this was a very important lesson on discipleship. One of the most powerful images that Jesus uses is the yoke in this lesson. And this is a cross piece that's used to pair animals so that they can work together. Jesus invites us to take up his yoke. Think about what it means to take up the yoke and burden of Jesus. Remember that John the Baptist is in prison during this time for his preaching, and Jesus is also being pressured to conform to the religious and social norms of the day. Often, often God's messengers suffer prison and violence because of people's misguided understanding on how God works in this world and how we are supposed to be responding to God. He doesn't promise that we won't face problems, but does promise to be with us as we face them. Life as a Christian isn't guaranteed to be an easy road. Jesus says that the generations, that this generation is like children playing music and expecting to get different reactions by the different music they play. A lively pipe should cause dancing, while a sad dirge should cause mourning. 
They're disappointed when they don't get the response they expect. Jesus says they have the wrong expectations, so they reject John and Jesus for different reasons. They say John's serious approach has to mean that he's been possessed by a demon, and Jesus' joyfulness is surely evidence that he is drunk. Is it possible that the truths they miss is that God is trying to reach and draw people to the gospel by using a variety of approaches? This reminds me of my years in teaching and how we were taught to use varieties of methods so that the children who might not get the idea one way would be able to understand it in another way. Could God be doing this with us? With John, God uses a world-denying approach. And with Jesus, he uses a world-affirming approach. In verse 19, Jesus says, Wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Wisdom, the truth or right way, can be proved by the deeds or works that we demonstrate by the way we live and the choices we make. For example, will we respond to John the Baptist and follow Jesus? Jesus condemns some of the cities where he's already proclaimed the gospel because they refuse to see him even though he has, they have seen the demonstrations of God's powers through the miracles that Jesus has performed. He says that even those in the city of Sodom would have responded to the demonstrations of God's power and would have been saved if they had seen what the cities of Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida had witnessed. Even though they had seen this, seen all of his miracles in these cities, they were still blind and didn't believe. Jesus thanks God for hiding the truth about life from the wise and giving it to the infants or the children. It wasn't given to the religious leaders in the temples who were in charge of all the rules associated with religion of the day. It was given to regular people like the fishermen who didn't think they had all the rules and answers already. They had open eyes, ears, minds, and hearts. They were open to Jesus. Jesus alone can reveal to us the truth about God. He knows him because he was sent by God. He is the son of God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the only one who can show us how God works in this world and how we should be responding to God. We can turn to Jesus, accept the truth that he reveals about God, and live the life that he would choose for us. He offers a promise by inviting us to find God's rest for all those who will come to him. This implies a deliberate decision to acknowledge Jesus as Christ, our Savior, and to follow him as Lord. Jesus knows all things about God and makes these things known to us. He promises to give us comfort and to lift our burdens. Jesus then issues a command, take my yoke upon you. The obligations that go along with connecting their lives with his and his kingdom will not be easy. He invites them to set aside the yoke of legalism, rules and requirements offered by the religious leaders of the day and take up the yoke of freedom that comes from a full knowledge and a relationship with Jesus. He says his yoke is easy and his burden is light because when we follow Jesus, we're living the life God created us to live. The Christian life fits and we don't depend on our own power, but on the power of Christ who lives within us. Or perhaps the yoke is easy and the burden is light because we're not required to earn our own salvation. His saving grace is given freely. Being a Christian doesn't mean convincing Jesus to approve our agenda, but being a Christian does mean submitting ourselves to his agenda. It's all about him. In conclusion, what does this picture of the yoke tell us about living the Christian life? The yoke is a symbol of connection. Taking the yoke upon ourselves remind us that we, reminds us that we don't have to carry our burdens as believers on our own. So how do we become a community where people trust that they can come with their burdens and find rest? How can we encourage people to be themselves? In what ways does our congregation offer to lighten the burdens of others that come to us? 
Are we a welcoming place of rest? We are part of a team whose members can work together to build a welcoming and loving community with these goals in mind. The yoke is also a symbol of discipline. Taking the yoke upon ourselves reminds us that we cannot go off on our own tangents. We can't pursue our own personal ambitions. Instead, we must move toward a common purpose or goal with the other members of our team. Finally, the yoke is a symbol of empowerment. Taking the yoke upon ourselves helps us to accomplish together what we can't achieve on our own because we are connected to others who help bear the load. Therefore, the yoke's not a burden to hold us back, but a connection that helps empower us to live the life that God calls us to live and be the church God calls us to be. Now, let's have our closing prayer. Gracious God, we want to be faithful to you and to your ways as we live in this world. Help us to trust in you no matter what circumstances we face. Help us to live in confidence that you are working your purposes out. Help us to be a light in the darkness and to be a place of welcome and rest for all who are searching for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.